Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar, The Seven Disciplines of Internet Sales Success. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer On, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency, best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. After NADA, uh, a few months ago, we were awarded the Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Award for top-rated websites for an unprecedented sixth year in a row. We also took home the AWA Award for Best Websites for a third time. Plus, FCA announced that we're now an approved vendor. We're still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program. Ooh, a lot of stuff is happening over here. Do you want to know more? Yeah, you do. You can check us out at our gorgeous brand new DealerOn website at DealerOn.com. Also, DealerOn will be presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit in Vegas in a couple weeks. So if you're going to be there, please stop by and say hi. And also check out the incredible speaking sessions for, from my friends Greg Gifford and Sean Rains. We hope to see you there. We have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have the one and only Corey Mosley as our presenter today. Corey Mosley, CSP, is the principal of Mosley Automotive and a proven leader in transforming dealerships. A go-to strategist and progressive retail expert, Corey looks beyond simple solutions to help his clients uncover and correct complex issues that drive customer satisfaction, accelerate sales, and fuel profitability. Over the past 18 years, Corey has been featured at every major automotive conference, including Driving Sales, J.D. Powers, NADA, and he was the first internet sales expert to keynote the Digital Dealer Conference. In addition to his more than 18-year sales and consulting career, he's also the author of The Way I See It, Thoughts, Commentary, and Musings of a Retail Car Guy. And he hosts the show Progressive Retail with Corey Mosley on the CBT Automotive Network. He can be reached at Corey at MosleyAutomotive.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. Don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And guess what? Our good friends at Mosley Automotive, they're giving away some great prizes today on the webinar. Two of you lucky webinar attendees are going to win a fabulous prize. You'll have your choice of winning either a signed copy of his book, The Way I See It, a coffee mug that says it's okay to rewrite the rules, or a gift box of pecan jacks. Your choice. You have to be on the live broadcast to find out, though. So stay tuned, and who knows, you might be winning an awesome prize today. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. So fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. We want your opinion to be heard. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation. So please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. Uh, you can also hit up Corey Mosley at Corey Mosley. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. All right, everyone, let's get started. Let's learn the seven disciplines of Internet sales success. Corey Mosley, I can't tell you how good it is to have you on the show again. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm worn out already. I always, <laughs> I always get worn out on these introductions. Holy no. moly. So much awesomeness to share with the people out there, but you know what? We have a lot to get to today. After all, seven disciplines of internet success, I legitimately only thought there might be two or three, so I'm looking forward to hearing all of this automotive awesomeness that you're going to drop on us in the next hour, and I know you have a lot to get to. So where do we want to start? Well, listen, I'm very excited. I know we blocked this from 12 to 7 uh, this evening, so <laughs> this is going to be an excellent seven hour. We're dedicating one hour per discipline. Um, so. Thanks for all of you who have taken the day off to participate in this. I truly appreciate it. Okay, he's joking, and, uh, people. He's joking. Maybe an hour and a half. Maybe. I'll we'll see. <laughs> so, so, so in, in keeping with this, and thank you for the wonderful introduction as always, um, you know, you, you, we think about our resume. We think about our body of work. And ultimately, it's not just for, for accolades or, or having done things, but having done things creates experiences. And through those experiences of spending the last 18 years in retail and consulting, um, 
we continue to work on those processes. So where a lot of people know us from, you know, the BDC Internet era now, we spend a lot of time in sales operations and culture and, and have gone in other areas. But fundamentally, um, when we've looked back and said, hey, what are, the, what are the areas over all these years of consulting and working with dealers and manufacturers, what are the core areas, and we had to boil it down, you know, people, people like three, five, seven, you know, scientifically, uh, so to speak. Nobody wants to hear the 33 disciplines, right? But what are the <laughs> core areas where we see things go right or we see things go wrong? And I'm going to talk about those seven disciplines today. For, for a period of time, um, we had a document available on our site, which everyone has in their handout. The handout is a, uh, is a do-it-yourself model that will speak to some of the things I'm going to share with you today. So it's not the content I'm covering, it's the aftermath of the content. So be sure to, to download that. And we had that for, on our site for a while. So some people may have been exposed to the seven disciplines, um, but have not necessarily heard me go into a little bit more detail or, or break them out. So I want to share that with you uh, today. So we'll give you an introduction and explanation of the seven disciplines today as an objective. Um, and then we'll get to the fun stuff, giveaways, and then certainly um, want to have time for, for Q&A uh, opportunities as well for, for the audience that uh, is attending live. So we talk about the seven disciplines. Let's just get them out there, and then we'll go into them kind of on a one-by-one -one phase. Um, and we will look at those seven disciplines. And for those of you also who watch my show on CBT, Progressive Retail, because I am told it's more than just me and my mother and my office staff that watch it. Uh, for those of you, for those it's of you an awesome show, show, by the way. It's really Thank incredible, you. and more people should should tune in if you haven't already. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've covered a whole series on this. So this will be another area for you to get reinforcement on the things we're talking today. Because I've, I've actually done uh, a show on each of these topics uh, in a little more detail. But when we talk about the seven disciplines, we're talking about the discipline of engagement, the discipline of training the discipline of coaching, the discipline of marketing, the discipline of team, the discipline of execution, and the discipline of process. So I want to start to walk through uh, all of those individually for you and then uh, kind of move forward into to the discussion from there and really hone in on why some of these things are important and share that with you kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. So let's start with number one. So when I talk about the idea of engagement, right, at the end of the day, Anybody in the internet department, any, anybody in the, in a dealership, really, it doesn't matter if it's really sales or service, ultimately, we're left in a model of client engagement where we're trying to get the customer to take an action. So for my internet managers, my BDC managers, of course, the action may start with the appointment. The action may start with answering the phone. The action may start with getting them to show for the appointment. So you're always walking through that process of engagement to get the customer to now take an action. I think most of us would agree, regardless of how long you've been in the business, whether you're six months on this call or you just started or you've been in the business like myself for 18, 20 years or more, um, at the end of the day, we do realize that engagement ultimately drives everything that we're doing. And within that subset of engagement, we kind of have these key areas that I'd like you to have for your consideration. Many times, what we're able to accomplish in an hour is to set the table. So there's work to be done post this call. So I want you to look at what we're covering today as the opportunity to set the table, to get you thinking, and to really challenge you to say, hey, how do we do in these particular areas? How do we perform in these particular areas? So with engagement, we're talking about a couple things. Number one, we're talking about identifying our points of control. So people a lot of times think that control is a bad word, but of course control is hugely important in our business. Everything we do in marketing is meant to control us. The selection of colors, what colors mean, when we pick a logo, when we pick our brand messaging. Uh, now when you go into certain department stores or certain retail environments, they have signature scents, which they, which they identified as scent marketing. So that you, that you make an association about the brand based on the smell. There's all these different factors that are designed uh, to control what we think, control the, the next actions that we take, um, which is very interesting. If you think about somebody like a Steve Jobs, he was, he was well noted as never um, using focus groups. And when they asked him, why don't you use focus groups, his answer was always, uh, people don't always know what they want. Sometimes they need to be told 
what it is that they want that they don't even know exists yet. And points of control and control as a positive word is something that I want us to, to regain our power in. And again, using it properly. So what are the points of control? Where are the areas in your communication, your engagements, whether they're initial communications, over email, over your text messaging, over chat, over your phone calls, over your engagement in the store? What are the points of control? Where are the areas where you have a scenario where you can, where an increase in activity happens or a decrease in activity? What do I mean by that? In the engagement process, let's say on a phone call, when I've opened the call, so you've called an internet customer, they've answered the phone, now that's a point of control. The opening of the call is a point of control, whether what you say can increase your opportunity to move them to the next step or decrease the opportunity. So have you looked at all of the areas where you can make that control? Number two, what are the contingency plans that you have in place? Now, contingency plans could be construed as a fancy word uh, for us in the idea of, of, of our rebuttals. So what are the contingency plans? What happens when a customer does not do what you want them to do? And this assumes that everybody is on the same page, and we'll talk about that a little later today. That assumes that if I showed up right now at your dealership, Brandy on this call, if I drove right down the street and walked into your dealership, uh, down the street from my home, what would happen? Would I get the same process? Would talking to you be different than talking to somebody else? If I called the store, if I sent in an email right now, would I get different messages from different people? I just came back from a dealership uh, in, in the West Coast, in Cali, and very large store, very powerful store, selling a lot of units, 18 people involved in their BDC and their internet department. And when I sat down to communicate with them and talk about the process, I learned that everybody was doing something differently. So that was a clear explanation for me as to why the results were not consistent to what they think they should be or the closing ratios, because everybody wasn't on the same page. They hadn't identified their points of control. They hadn't identified what the contingency plans are. So when a customer says, no, I don't need to test drive the car, what is the next step? How is that documented? What is the play there? When the customer says, no, I don't need to know the option. I don't need uh, to come in to know, know about the option packages. I know I want package 1B and I want the premium plus. Now what do you do? What are the contingency plans that walk through that process? Step three here is going to be what are the effects on effective versus persuasive communication. And for most people, they don't understand necessarily the difference in that model. And how I always explain effective versus persuasive is effective communications explain, persuasive communications sell. This is really huge when we talk about things like your template library or your engagement strategy over text messages, the things that you have that are static, that are pre-written, that are going out to customers. Because a lot of times, we've taken a Ron Popeil method to it. And if anybody knows the name Ron Popeil, he's a well-known inventor. He coined the phrase, set it and forget it. So if you've ever, for anybody with insomnia or up at 3 in the morning and you see the guy on there uh, selling the rotisserie oven, uh, that's Ron Popeil. And Ron Popeil has set it and forget it. And that's how a lot of us have treated the communications and the sales process inside our CRM. We've taken a set it and forget it approach. We put something in place a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. We said, great, check the box. We got templates. They're done. And we've never gone back to really look at that. We've never gone back to say, hey, as a consumer, step into the consumer shoes for a moment. If I got this communication, would that make me more interested in calling the dealership, more interested in scheduling the appointment, more interested in buying a car? Would it make me le less interested? Or would it have no effect on me either? Because the, the last two are the same. If a customer is not enticed to want to further engage with you, uh, they're whether negatively or they're not at all, those two are the same thing. It has to be a structure where they are looking at ways that they can and want to take the next step. For those of you that have ever gotten a credit card mailer, a solicitation for a Capital One card or a Chase card or whatever in the mail, if you, open those, if you open those solicitations, for those of you that do, those are the persuasive communications. 
See, those are the communications that tell you about the 0% and 0% uh, interest forever and transfer your balances and we're the best card and no blackout dates and you're going to love it. And then you go, oh, this sounds really good. Ooh, how does this compare to my other cards? Oh, I, I think I'm going to do this. This is the persuasive communication. The effective communication is what comes when you get the card. For those of you who've gotten a credit card recently, you get the credit card, right? It's a thick envelope. You get the credit card, and then you get this thing called the terms and conditions. It, it folds down, basically down to the floor, accordion style, and it has all the rules and regulations. And if you miss a payment, we're going to come take your children and your house and all these other things. Those are the effective communications because those explain exactly what's going to happen. Many times we find in our mystery shops, and we literally do uh, thousands of mystery shops, we find that people are so focused on being effective, meaning explaining, you know, these are our hours, uh, or, or, you know, here's when we're available, or this is the car. We're, we're, we want to be so specific and effective by delivering information that we leave out the whole most important part, which is the persuasive part. So I want you to go back and start looking at your template libraries, and I'm challenging you to do this, to go back and look at the communications that are going out and saying, hey, did we just explain something, or did we actually persuade somebody to want to take the, the next step? And with engagement, first impressions are going to be huge. Uh, we hear this, the little, people miss the little things. Because here's what happens. Every single person on this call right now that is working in a dealership operates on autopilot. And I don't say this, and I don't use this word as a bad word, but it just is. You are on autopilot, meaning especially in the Internet Department BDC. If you're somebody on this call right now that's making 70, 80, 90 calls a day, trying to bring customers in, traditional BDC, turn over, you know, the, bring them in, turn them over and work them, you're super on autopilot because you're going in, taking the same action over and over and over again. So whatever is in your programming, whatever it is that you do, you do instinctively at this point. So that's always a challenge to training, right, is that, you, you have to undo behavior, and that behavior, especially when you're dealing with volume, hundreds and hundreds of leads, some of you thousands of leads, right, that behavior is being done so many times. So first impressions become huge. What do I mean by that? I mean, I hear people all day long when we listen to phone calls inside our organization um, making calls on speakerphone and then fumbling to pick up the phone uh, to leave the message. Or I hear people... Uh, you know, I can tell when somebody's on call number 63 of the day. I hear people talking on the phone, leaving a message, and then hanging up the phone in the process. So before they're even finished, their voice just starts to fade away as they go to hang up the phone call. Those are just bad first impressions. Things like spell check, things like, uh, uh, th things like how, how we're putting sentences together. Um, you can't be the premier dealership in the nation uh, using the word premier with the E on the end of it. So, you know, we have to think about those type of things, and all of those things contribute to engagement in the discipline. Discipline number two, training. So before you tell me about how much you train, and I get this all the time from managers, owners, GMs, oh, Corey, we train, 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 train. We train, 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 train. We train every day here. Every day, 30 minutes a day, we start our meetings, 8.15, 8.30. We train, 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 train. So I want to give you four uh, steps inside this discipline to maximize that. I remember being in a store, and I'll never forget it. I remember being in a training room of a dealership, and they were train, train, train. And listen, obviously they had made the investment to have me come in and, and do training, so I certainly applaud them for that. But when I was in the training room, I looked around the room, and some of you may think about this right now in your own stores. I looked around the room, and I saw these posters on the wall, and these posters had, you know, various word tracks and road to sale, you know, strategies and just quotes and things like that, which were fine, training quotes and, you know, inspect what you expect, different things like that. And I went over to one of the posters, and I looked in the corner, the bottom right corner of the trademark, the copyright date. The copyright date on one of them said 1979, and another one said 1983. And I thought to myself, wow, it would seem that there's an opportunity here uh, because our customers aren't necessarily the same customers as they was. 
So if you've been in this business five years, tell me to yourself right now internally, um, how has the business changed for you in five years in the business? How has the business changed in 10 years in the business? If you've been in the business for the past year, think about all the changes in technology and strategies and you know, uh, text messaging as, a, as an appointment generating strategy. You know, that didn't exist four or five years ago. So when you think about all these changes, you have to say, well, we also have to move at that pace. Has our training moved at that pace? So I'm going to give you four elements here to consider. Number one is frequency. So for everyone that tells me how much they train every day, there are people who tell me that they train very sporadically. They train, oh, on the spot. They don't have a regimented training program. Uh, they're relying on, on, you know, simple training. You know, listen, we're going over things. We could call this a training, this webinar here. Um, but I don't know you. I'm not working one-on-one. -on -one. I can't do drill downs. I'm not listening to your phone calls. So we also have to qualify what we're, what we're calling that. But frequency is going to be important. How often, how, how big a part is training a part of your regimen and your growth strategy um, at the dealership? Everybody's looking for growth. I was in a meeting yesterday where we're looking at fancy charts and radiuses and pump in, pump out and, and data of, of AMAs and DMAs and all the acronyms that you want to think about. And, you know, we're in a marketing meeting. We're talking about marketing and what we could be doing for marketing. And all of that stuff is great. But at the end of the day, if your activity level or your aggressiveness in marketing is not keeping pace with the education of your team, then you've got challenges. So frequency is going to be an issue. Number two, freshness. So that goes back to my point. 1983 on the copyright. Well, there's a lot of things that have changed. There's a lot of word tracks. There's a lot of strategies that um, are being used today. So freshness, it's no longer just if you do it. If I'm just rehashing or retraining on the 30-year-old concept and the market has changed or the needs of the consumer have changed based on their availability of information and education, if all those things are factors, then my question becomes, how fresh is the content? Number three, qualification. You know, it's very important, uh, Eliana, we were talking about this a little bit before we got on the call and, and got on the webinar. We were talking about the, the dangers um, and downsides. Not sure what just happened there. We were talking about the dangers and downsides to the qualification, to the ability that everybody has a voice. So like anybody can get on, you can start your blog for free, you can start tweeting for free, you can do all of this stuff at any point in time. Everybody has the opportunity to have a voice. Everybody can make up a quote or steal somebody else's and say it's theirs. Um, but everybody can do that. But we've got to go back to the qualification. I have a rule of thumb. And my rule of thumb in life that I, that I go by when it comes to advice is the person giving the advice has to be more qualified than myself to give that advice. So they have to have a unique qualification. For example, at this stage in the game, I do not have children. So it's probably not a smart idea, um, or I probably wouldn't be qualified, let me say, to give out advice to people on how they should parent their children. I could have an opinion. I could say yes when your kid is screaming on the plane, smack him so that he gets quiet. I could say that, right? But that doesn't mean I'm qualified to do it. So as many of you on the call seek out different strategies, whether it's paid training or free training or somebody's blog or commentary, be very, very careful that we don't simply take a concept and run with it just because someone said it or just because we read it in a blog or just because someone tweeted about it or they wrote an article about it. That doesn't make it so. So really think about qualification. And then also diversification in training. Diversification is going to be important. So what type of training are you bringing into your organization? How are your people getting trained? How are you getting trained yourself? And when it comes to training, I have to encourage everybody on, everybody on this call is, would not be classified as a decision maker, right? There's a lot, there's a lot of frontline front line individuals, the managers, directors. Uh, there's some, I know there's GMs and owners on the list too, but diversification's going to be important here. Where are you getting your information? Don't be afraid to go out. If you're on the front lines, if you're a BDC representative, if you're an internet sales representative, I hear it all too often. You know, we're, we're coming to town with a workshop, and, oh, Corey, we would really love to go, you know, but my dealer won't pay. 
you have to make some decisions from a career standpoint and have to make some decisions to make sure that you're investing in yourself also. But diversification is going to be important. So a lot of times training is only internal. So it's, you know, oh, my sales manager does all the training here. My, you know, we have an internal trainer that does all the training here. That's one voice. That's one type of qualification potentially sharing that information from you. But you want to diversify. I have plenty of colleagues in the business. Eliana, we talked about this. We were, we were name, name passing in conversation also. We were talking about this earlier. I have a lot of colleagues, a lot of people who have been on uh, dealing on webinars, who have, who have their ideas, who are successful, who are qualified. They, they, fit, the bold, they, they fit the mold for, for, for uh, bullet point three here, uh, very qualified. And they have a different strategy. They have a different approach than I might have. That doesn't make any of us wrong. Uh, but it's important to find what, what, if you have highly qualified people that have executed strategies that are successful and you diversify, you take in those opinions, and then you can figure out the strategy that's best for you. You know, for example, we hear a lot about this when it comes to video and the use of video. I think it's excellent to use, uh, to use, to be using video in your process. However, every store is not ready for that or situated for that. Or there's other areas that they need to get to before they can execute a more advanced strategy or a strategy that has more logistics to it. So diversification in your training is going to be important also. Um, and I'd like you to have that for consideration. I think we've got a poll question. Yes, we do. All right, audience. Your first of three poll questions is on the screen now. We love it if you take part in our poll questions. It really helps us out. So... The first poll question is, when thinking about the training your dealership does, what was the last time a new concept or strategy was introduced in your dealership? We want to know. Please select one of the following answers. Was it just this month that you had a new concept or strategy? Was it within the last 90 days? Was it three to six months ago? Or maybe it was over six months ago, or is it the last one which says it's been way too long since we've had a new concept or strategy introduced at our dealership. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. And by the way, um, I did uh, want to let you know, Corey, we had a nice comment that came in from Dan, uh, you know, speaking about what you were talking about. He says, everything's totally different now in the car industry. Our customers today know so much more about the products. Sometimes it feels like they're coming just to order. They're not coming to shop. Very For interesting sure. take, Dan. Thank you. That's right. He's 100% he's on point. So when we say that, so while you're closing the poll, I want to make a quick point. I, have the, I, I, I call these things wish questions. I hear a lot of people in the Internet and BDCs They'll ask the customer a question like, uh, have you test driven the car yet? Uh, are you familiar with the option packages? I call those wish questions. What we do is we ask that question, then we cross our fingers and close our eyes and hope and wish that they say no because when they say no, that gives us the opportunity to use that as an appointment. But to Dan's point, all too often, they go, oh, yeah, I just had one as a rental car or, or my next-door neighbor has one or my sister's cousin's mother you know, has that car. I don't need to drive it. Or, yeah, I know I want the premium plus package with the XYZ on it and the, and, the, and the ABC. And they know already. So then you're stuck. And then now we're talking about price and we're getting ground into the dust. By the <laughs> All right, let's close this poll and share the results. Are you ready for this, Corey? Yes. Let's do it. All right. When thinking about training, nice. your dealership does. When was the last time a new concept or strategy was introduced? 45% of today's awesome audience said just this month. What? That's great. That's good. That's All right. good. Let's see the rest of the results. Probably, they probably weren't watching my show or something. Maybe <laughs> might be some, there might be some clients on the call. Maybe, Maybe that's I what it know. is. I don't know. All right. Let's see the rest of the results. 18% of today's audience say within the last 90 days. 12% of today's audience say three to six months ago. Only 3% of today's audience said over six months ago. But, I like the honest people on the bottom here. I know. 22% of today's audience, so nearly a quarter of today's audience, said it's been way too long since a new concept or strategy was introduced at their dealership. All right, got Corey. got copyright, 1983 on it. <laughs> Corey, is... Yeah. Is this what you were expecting to see? What are you hoping to see? What what should dealers be doing? Do you think that there should always be change? People don't like change. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, change, there's, there's change for the sake. So what I don't like is I don't like um, erratic change. <laughs> so there's, and people confuse uh, change with strategy. Strategy is a, so people always ask me and, you know, um, I have several colleagues in the business and um, on occasion we may talk to a dealer and, hey, you know, what, what's different with you and this person? And there's a, there's a lot of people that are great at execution. There's a, there's a lot of people that, you know, can come to your, will come to your store and they'll just sit next to you and, and dial the phone with you all day. And that's great. They're great executors. There's a, but there's a difference between um, just making a change and, and strategy, sitting down and, and looking at a concept, looking at a series of circumstances, and then taking actions or building a plan based around, based around that. Looking at what's working, if something's not working, then you change it. Right. So that's not change for the sake of change. There are people who you know, are just like, hey, Gordon Gecko has a famous statement. I use this some for, I love my clients, but I use this term more uh, really, uh, you're scary. Really? You're going to quote Wall Street? <laughs> I'm going to quote Wall Street. Well, it's the 30th anniversary, for those who don't know. It's like going to be back in, they're bringing it back to theaters for like two or three days. Okay. Um, so it's very apropos at the moment. But there's a, there's a famous line, and I've been having to use it all too often lately. Um, the line is, Charlie Sheen says, Gordon, why do you have to wreck this company? And he says, because it's wreckable. And I find that, and I find that many times um, there's just some burning reason why people who have the authority um, to make a change, they have the, the power of the pen, as we call it in the business, they have the power to make a change, um, and they will just change things for, for no reason. Um, and that's very troubling. That's completely different than implementing a strategy. By the way, you just made a lot of people feel old by telling them that Wall Street is 30 years old. <laughs> so thanks for That's that, including yeah, me, I by the way. I, I think I was just born. I was just born. Uh, I think, uh, so that's all right. Nobody knows. <laughs> the Internet knows, though. The internet knows all oh, the Internet knows everything. All right. All right, all right. let's keep going. Is this number three? No, we are uh, – maybe. I don't know which one we're on. We're, we're, what I do know is we're on coaching. Okay. So we're on, the, we're on the coaching discipline. So let's talk about the coaching discipline. Uh, so coaching is so hugely missed in our business. And let me clarify. Coaching is not the morning meeting where we talk about how everybody sucks and how we don't have enough appointments and how we need more deals and how everybody needs to get on the ball and how, uh, how, how somebody's going to lose their job and chide people for, you know, not being at enough deals. That's not coaching. And in our business, there needs to be a huge investment, and I'm just preaching for a second, uh, a huge investment in how to coach people, how to develop people. Uh, not, how, not training. Training is a separate discipline. Coaching. What's your co – and I have three breakdowns here for coaching. Number one is what the approach to coaching is. So the approach is not the first part. The approach to coaching is looking for performance opportunities and explaining and filling in the blanks and closing the gaps on how somebody can get from where they are to where they need to be. It's finding the wins and finding the opportunities and delivering that message in a way that the recipient of that information can get the message, can implement change, can understand what is expected, what may be not being uh, done, and how to get better. To that meaning that everybody sucks, you need to get more people in here, so how many appointments, you're having that conversation right now, it's Saturday, so everybody's, I mean, it's Thursday, so everybody's having that Saturday conversation. What, What's Saturday look like? How many appointments we got? We need to get more in. Go, 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 go. And then we leave the meeting. We don't coach. We don't complete the scenario. You know, we do a lot of coaching inside our organization. And when, when someone gets on a coaching call, we've looked at metrics. We've looked at numbers. We've listened to phone calls. We know what has taken, what's taken place, where are the wins, where are the opportunities, what specific action steps can be done to help in the process improvement. 
So your approach is going to be huge. A, if you don't have a coaching program, uh, a consistent coaching program, you need to you need to certainly look at how you can get one immediately set up in your store. Uh, number two is going to be frequency. So again, a lot of times people consider coaching reprimand time. That was coaching. Oh man, something something happened. Something went wrong. You didn't log something. There were no notes on this customer. So now we're going to have a meeting to talk about notes. That's not coaching. That's a one-off reprimand session. So frequency is going to be very important. How often do you do this inside our organization? We meet with, we coach with BDC managers, internet managers, a minimum of twice a month, sometimes weekly, depending on the situation. So. And that's a consistent cadence of when that's going to happen. So they know every two weeks on this day, there's going to be a coaching session, and it's going to cover this information. So for my BDC, I know from some of the names that were called out, there's people on here that are leading teams. You, you have BDC teams, Internet teams, multiple people working under you, working for you, uh, that you have the opportunity to coach, develop, lead, and train as part of your job. So what is the coaching program in your store? How have you had that set up? How are you executing that? What is the frequency? Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it groups um, as, it approaches, as it points to that? And the third point, no, that's not a misquote, training. Training on how to coach. And this isn't something, this isn't a plug for us because uh, we don't teach how to coach, but there are a ton of resources out there on how to actually coach, whether you get it from books, whether you get it from videos, but actual methodologies to have, to have effective coaching sessions uh, with your team members. Um, I encourage you to, I don't, I don't care if it's a skill path, local seminar for 249 um, on it, but to get that education and to get trained on that, just because your business card says manager on it, that does not de facto make you an effective coach. So I really like to drive that point home and make that for consideration for people. Um, a coaching strategy is going to be paramount to sales growth. It is not the marketing meeting. There's so much reliance on what the ad is going to be, on what the PPC company is going to do, on what the retargeting is going to look like, on what the Halloween banner is going to be on the website as a means to how we drive traffic. Oh, is the radio working? Is the TV working? What should the ad be? There's so much emphasis on that as the answer. But developing the human capital inside your store, especially inside, an you're talking to somebody on the phone today uh, and on this webinar who completely 100% understands the importance of a functioning, highly functioning internet and BDC department and the need for it. So if some of you on this call right now may be working every day saying to yourself, nobody appreciates what we're doing, uh, it, you know, we're secondary in the store, and all of that stuff may be true in a lot of instances in terms of, in terms of the feeling. But I can tell you, as someone who cares and as someone who has come through the business doing that job, I realized I left out my slide this morning, Eliana, of, of <laughs> me. Uh, of, uh, you've seen my slide with me in my polo shirt when I was like 19 and my little pager. I left that, I left that out today. But other it people was very fetching, it. by the way. <laughs> yeah, go, go, to one of my, go to one of my other Dealer On uh, archive webinars. You'll see that picture. But as someone who sat there, I have complete empathy and strong belief system on the importance of the work that you're doing. And I want to see you develop. So if you're on this call today and you have the power to lead and you're empowered with leading and developing your people, I implore you to get an effective coaching program in place for them. Oh, it's a poll question. Yes, it is. By the way, Ron Garverick just wrote yeah. in. He says, the pager? I remember that picture, LOL. How could you ever forget it? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Ron. I was very fetching. I was very fetching. Thank very you, fetching. Ron. All right. <laughs> Let's, has your wife seen that picture, by the way? <laughs> yes, she has. She says, what happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Second poll question is on the screen now. We'd love it if you took part in our poll questions. Here we go. Have you or your manager ever been trained on how to properly coach your team? Simple question, right? Please select one of the following answers. Yes, and we have a great coaching plan in place. Yes, but we could probably be doing a better job at it. Sort of, but we admit that we put our work or our sales before training. No, but it's something we should look to get better at 
or nah, who needs coaching? All right, so once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. So the votes are coming in kind of slow. I know you're kind of probably talking it over, aren't you? Okay, so we want to know, have you or your manager ever been trained on how to properly coach your team? And you are not talking about training, right? Very big distinction. It's not talking That's about correct. a new way to do something in the dealership. It's more on... And correct me if I'm wrong, Corey, but it's more how to handle certain situations, not by process. How to develop your people. How right. to develop your people. How to identify, how, how to praise, how to identify opportunities, and then how to provide the answers um, so people comprehend, take action, and are able to get better. There you go, people. So are you guys doing that? So we want to know, yes, we have a great coaching plan in place. Yes, but we could probably be doing a better job at it. Sort of, but we admit that we put work in sales before any kind of coaching or training. No, but it's something we should look to get better at or nah, who needs coaching? All right, <clears throat> let's close this poll and share the results. Are you ready, sir? Yes. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, audience, thank you so much for your votes. Let's see, have you or your manager ever been trained on how to properly coach your team? 4% of today's audience say, yeah, we're coaching ninjas. We have a great coaching plan in place. Interesting. 30% of today's audience, so almost a third of today's audience says yes, but they admit that they could probably be doing a better job at it. 26% of today's audience say sort of, but they admit that they'll put work or sales before any kind of training or coaching. Now the majority of today's audience, 39% of today's oh. audience say oh. no, but they know it's something that they should look to get better at. And 2% of today's audience, who are you 2% says, nah, who needs coaching? <laughs> and I do, I do want to share something. Brandy wrote in and says, my managers are great coaches. They're very encouraging, always bring us up rather than down, even if we're having a bad month. So props to your managers, Brandy. That's great to hear. And yep. my question to you, Corey, would be, yep. now, we always say training is important. I you're, honestly, in all the years I've been doing webinars, you're the this is the first time I've ever heard somebody say that coaching is important. So forgive well, me, but I, I must ask. I must ask. Maybe because they're confusing it with training, but I have to ask you: How often do you believe that your team should be coached? I think you need to. So number one, I, I so I'll give you an example. You know, when we come into a store, uh, one of the things that we do is we meet with every person. Um, that's going to be affected by the work we're doing individually. And we run them through a um, nine or ten question survey piece. Um, and one of those questions helps us design how they like to be coached. So I think important, uh, number one, you need to understand your individual people on your team. Uh, some people are more direct. Some people will just crash it. The moment you go, um, here's an issue I want to talk about. There, you know, some people are just wrecked for the whole day. So understanding your team as part of setting it up is going to be very, very important. Um, and then you set the frequency really based on the need. So at the manager's level, manager to manager, so as a GM or an owner, um, I'm probably coaching uh, once a month um, with my management team. As I get down to the, the Internet teams, the BEC teams, the managers, um, I may want to implement I want to touch them at least twice a month um, because we're in an era of – so for those of you who came I – mean, I came into business in the late 90s, um, so I'm certainly not – haven't been in business 30 years, but it was still what I would call old school back then. Mm -hmm. And the model back then was no news was good news. If your manager wasn't talking to you or you weren't being called in the office, that meant everything was fine. The problem is in today's marketplace – Millennials, Gen X, in that, in that whole new world order, no news is bad news. If I'm not getting feedback, if I'm not getting engagement, then I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm doing a good job or a bad job, and that creates um, a disconnect in my ability to really highly execute. So I wouldn't be going more than uh, – I, I would really at least be doing twice a month um, coaching sessions. Again, this doesn't need to be block your day, block your morning – to, uh, to coach somebody. These could be 15, 20-minute sessions, mm -hmm. but they need to have a cadence. They need to have a, like a great story, a beginning, middle, and the end. Um, you need to find something. Po Listen, even if it's all negative, you need to find something positive. You need to understand what are the elements 
of structuring it. No different than structuring. I have this conversation with people. You know, I'm a member of. Uh, we talked about my my a credential as a CSP. That's not just a fancy credential. That's because I've uh, that's because I've invested the time and the effort. Uh, for those who potentially see me live, hopefully I was good when you've seen me uh, in live presentations. But I study the art of how to deliver content, deliver a presentation. Uh, where there's people who anybody can just get up and just start talking. There's a structure to how to deliver a great story, how to deliver a presentation. The same thing holds true on coaching. There's a structure on how to do it. Not just, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, numbers are down. We we you know we need to turn this around here. All right, good talk. Okay, so uh, the distinction has been made. Training should be done how often? Coaching should be done once or twice a month. But coaching is done um, at, coaching it, to is, the whole team, or do you do it individually? Do you give it to the well, squeaky well, person? I'm definitely, squeaky wheel I'm definitely, gets the Yeah, I definitely believe in individual coaching. So. Um, Coaching can be done at the individual level because it's really about personal development, self-development. Training is about is about explaining and executing concepts or strategies. Mm -hmm. So, so if I come in and we're talking about, I introduce a word track, one of our word tracks that we use. I introduce that word track. I'm training you on it. Okay, great. Let's get on the phone and now make the next call using the new word track. Let's talk about how. Let's talk about the concept. Let's talk about the activity. Coaching is when I come back two weeks later and go, all right, I've listened to, let's listen to these 10 phone calls. Let's, let's, let's uh, listen to how you've kind of executed on that. And here's a lot of things you're doing well. I like how you're opening this lineup, but here's where we can now, here's where we can look to get better, and here's what I would do differently. So that was a, you can, you can mix and match the two all you want, but coaching uh, takes on a very personal role and it has a different structure um, than, than training. Interesting. All right. Let's keep going. We still have some more awesomeness to get to. Yes. Awesomeness on deck. <laughs> okay. So marketing. I mean, again, marketing obviously could take forever, but I just break marketing into three kind of buckets. We all knew attribution is the hot buzzword going around the industry today. Um, there's some books coming out. Who sold it? I think um, um, Brian's working on Brian Pash is working on a new book uh, on attribution. A lot of people talking about attribution. Uh, so attribution is important, and we need to. I'm not. I'm not a tech guy. I stay in my lane. So I know how to uh, create change in people. I know how to implement strategy. Um, I know how to work on culture. Um, I'm not the guy who's up at three in the morning uh, looking at the Google Analytics. I'll leave that to dealer on and Greg and Sean and you guys. But what I do know is, obviously, we need to be we 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 need to be implementing and make sure you have a strategy that is as accurate as possible on what's happening with your marketing. The excuse I looked, I was in with a vendor the other day, and they put a report, and the report was basically. There were one million eyeballs on blah, 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 blah. A million impressions. So we can't, you know, we can't source that to leads, but, man, that's a lot of activity for you. So, so and by the way, can I get my check for the month? So I think it's important that you look at what you have in your strategy now on attribution. When we go into a store and we look at expenses, our average e our average expense reduction is about $5,800 a month that we find in waste, overspend, ineffective ROI um, inside of a store. And a lot of times that's just because we had a store that was a group that was spending almost $9,000 a month with a particular vendor, and they'd been on them for years. And we couldn't actually trace back one car sale to – the particular service that they were providing. And they'd been paying that bill on auto pay on their credit card for years. So it was just a matter of taking a look and backtracking and taking the time to look at that and, and, and see where the attribution uh, fits and the role it plays in there. Two other things, number one, which are more unique, unique terminologies to me, is something I call a net negative ROI. There is something, there is something to be said for having too many leads. For every conversation about how can we get more leads, how can we get more leads, there is something to be said. There is a tipping point in everybody's store, and that could be related to staffing. There could be a lot of things driving that, but there's a tipping point for everybody where 
you have this activity coming in, you have these expenses, and and for some of you that don't control expenses at your store, this, this may not be relevant, but you have these expenses, or you have these vendors or leads coming in, there is a point when it starts to go the other way. There's a point when there's so much capacity that you're over capacity on issues, and now that starts to hurt you. So your ROI goes the other way. You know, you're, that, that 12, 15, 18% that you're looking for is really buried in the fact that your team can't execute the strategy inside their process, inside your CRM properly. So it really creates a net negative ROI where you're overspending, you're creating too many opportunities that you can't execute on in the name of not missing any deals. But in reality, you're missing a ton of deals because the people uh, that are in the system aren't being taken care of at the level that they should be. And the final thing when it comes to marketing is, again, anybody who's seen me live knows I talk a great deal, especially when I talk to dealers about what I call who else-itis. Um, when you think about itis, uh, it's generally a medical term, right? Bronchitis, sinitis, bursitis. They're negative, like, medical situations. And I coined the phrase who else-itis because a lot of times, I find many dealers are just afraid to go first. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been over the years where a new company has come in or a new concept or a new strategy. We see this a lot now with you know text messaging or Facebook advertising um, where a new strategy comes in and the sole tipping point on the decision to invest is who else is doing it. And the dealership uses that path as a model for whether or not they should take an opportunity or take a chance at trying to get a competitive advantage. My answer is no, okay, let's not do it. Let's wait till the other 18,549 car dealers are all executing the same marketing strategy or, or, or on the same marketing channel. Let's wait till everybody's doing it and then we'll get involved. We gotta break from this fear when it comes to marketing. Uh, everything is not just sitting in the same bucket. There are buckets and channels that existed um, you know, that weren't there a year ago, they weren't there five years ago. So I encourage everybody, and even if you're not the decision maker, maybe you're an influencer, don't be afraid to go first to really get that competitive advantage. Our buildings look the same. Our cars look the same now. People have got, a bunch of people have got, everybody's serving Starbucks now. They're not serving Sanka anymore in their service department. We've come so far in a lot of instances that we've come so far that we're so, that we're so similar, right? Most people don't know this, but, um, you know, if you look at Kia Designs, if I have any Kia people on the call, Kia Designs have really gotten really sharp as of late. Well, they hired the designer from Audi. <laughs> so now, so, so now their designs are very similar. I, I thought... Um, the Sportage, I saw a Sportage going down the street the other day. I thought it was the Porsche Macan, and it was the new Kia Sportage because of the styling. So with so much being uh, neutralized and equalized in our business right now, the opportunity for you to do something and zig when everyone else is zagging is so significant in my opinion. Real quick on teams, give you a simple one. Developing your team, don't dismiss human capital. We're, we're in the thick of pay plans right now with a client, and we're, we're having this conversation, these fights over paying people, over, over wages and, and these type of things. And it's amazing to me how so many people talk about the importance of the BC and the inner department, and they're the front line, they're the front line, they're the front line, and then we don't want to pay anybody. So I don't, I don't want to start a controversy on this call, but my point is that there's some steps here on investing in the team. And the investing in the team is not just financial, but it's knowing. I know people right now. I know I know people right now working in a dealership that if the owner of the organization walked in the store, they would have no idea who that person was. How do you expect to build a team that will run out in the middle of traffic for you, that will fight for you, that will stay late for you, that will go the extra mile for you if you're, you have no connection to them? Know them. Grow them. That goes back to coaching. Commit to development. Inspire them. People want to, we, we are communal by nature. That's why we worship together. That's why we go to the bowling league. That's why everybody puts on the jersey of their favorite team on Sunday, even though their team could be zero for, zero for 16 at the end of a season. But they put on the jersey. They get out there together. They tailgate. They show because we're communal by nature. People need to be inspired for a common cause. And I understand we're not curing cancer by selling cars here, but it is something that we devote a lot of our time and our livelihood to. 
And having inspiration is very, very important. Next, you need to involve them. People need to have some of the best ideas. If you're a decision maker on this webinar right now, some of the best ideas are sitting with the people that you won't give the five minutes to share the idea with to. A lot of times we have a concept in the store or coming with a strategy, and someone will come to me and say, man, you know, I had that idea, but nobody would listen to me. Now they're listening to you because you're coming from a place of authority. So, you know, you're trying to fix the process or, or a strategy uh, in your internet department, in your BDC, and not to get off topic, but in any other area of your dealership. You know, the porter probably has a great idea for, um, for reducing the, the time it takes to get into the shop. Inside the BDC, somebody has a great idea on improving response time or, or, or engagement with the customer or, or creative writing as it relates to persuasive uh, techniques. So involve the people. And then reward them. Take the practical approach. Let's get some competition going. Uh, uh, an industry colleague of mine who focuses on service, a guy named Chris Collins, he's a master at gamification. He's worked wonders inside the service departments of dealerships um, by having these service managers challenges and, and learning to gamify to get people to, to do more work. It's very, very powerful. So look at ways that you can reward people uh, and get creative there as well. Process. Of course, we can talk about uh, internet disciplines without talking about process. So this is pretty important. Let me cover a couple of these very quickly for you. Why should they buy and how is that message conveyed in your process? Why should I buy a car from your dealership and how is that message conveyed? What is your short-term and long-term strategy? I was with a store selling 500 cars a month. They have a 30-day internet strategy. At the end of 30 days, the leads go into the loss bucket. I'll let you choke on that one for a minute on, 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 on the call. But what's the short-term strategy? What's the long-term strategy? How do they differ? What is the active versus inactive timeline? When are you activating, deactivating people? When's the last time you've looked at that strategy? And does everyone engaged in the process at your dealership actually understand? Is everybody on the same page? I've heard the word frighteningly to me. I don't know if I just made the word frighteningly up. but. I've heard the word freestyle used in the last several weeks in dealers we've been talking to, and I can't for the life of me understand why people in a six, seven, eight-person department, in a three-person department, in a two-person department are freestyling. Does everyone engaged understand what is happening and what is taking place there inside your process? All right, we got a quick poll question, and then we'll wrap up and get to uh, some giveaways. I think that's a great idea. All right, last, this is a very interesting question, by the way, audience. So I really, really, really want everyone to answer this question, okay? Here it is. It's on the screen now. If, if Corey walked into your dealership and asked the owner, the general manager, and the internet sales manager to each individually walk him through the internet processes, what are the chances that they would all say the same thing? I know, great question, right? We want to know what you think would happen in your dealership. So please select one of the following answers. Is it 100% all three of them are on the same page that would be exactly the same result? Do you think it's more like 80%? You know, the same for the most part. There might be a couple things that might be off. Do you think it's more like around 66%? Like two out of three would agree, all right? Do you think it's around 30%? where uh, they might agree on the first few steps, but not after that, or <laughs> good luck, that whole exercise should be pretty entertaining. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we are going to close this poll and share the results. Yeah, basically what we're looking for is, are your owner, your general manager, and your internet sales manager all on the same page when it comes to processes and strategies inside of your dealership? That's basically what we're looking for. So. That's right. Oh, the votes are not coming in too fast. <laughs> we'll see. Let's get on with it, people. <laughs> Let's get on with it. Yep. All right. Um, the votes are still coming in. So while we do that, while we're waiting for that, I did want to point out, um, Ron wrote in, and he says, training every day is so important, and 
every day means every day because every situation is so different. So thank you so much for sending that comment in, Ron. We do appreciate it. If you have a comment that you would like me to tell everyone as well as our wonderful presenter today, Corey Mosley, send that comment in and please send in your questions. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session very shortly. Okay. Um, I think it's time to shut down this poll question. Okay. All right. Here we go. Audience, thank you so much for getting involved in our poll questions. It really helps us out. <laughs> I All like right. this. Oh, you like these <laughs> answers? Okay, so. Corey <laughs> the last one tells the truth. <laughs> if Corey Mosley walked into your dealership and asked the owner, general manager, and the internet sales manager to each walk them through their internet sales process, what are the chances they would all say the same thing? Only 4% of today's audience said 100% they're all on the same page. Boom. 21% of today's audience say about 80%. It's going to be the same for the most part. Another 21% of today's audience say, eh, about two out of three of them would agree. Yeah, so it's like 66%. 19% of today's audience say, oh, it's only going to be about 30%. They might agree on the first few steps, but definitely not after that. But, ouch, the majority of today's audience, 34%, said, ha ha, good luck. That should be an entertaining exercise. Corey, is that what you're expecting to hear? Yeah. What? <laughs> after after a decade consulting and twenty years in this business, yes, that's exactly because I hear it every day. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I, what okay. I wanted to say. All right, audience, thank you so much. Now listen, we're going to get to the Q and A session soon, so get your questions in for the one and only Corey Mosley, and we'll get to them very quickly. All right, Corey, what else do we have left? All right, we've got execution. So process is important, but process is something that's loaded up and static, right? You put a follow-up process in your CRM. You put an email strata, an email process in your CRM. Now it's execution. So is the internal, external message in alignment? What are the habits and rituals? Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be around some great people through my work inside the National Speakers Association, and I really get access to, to just really – some of the best speakers and some of the best educators in the business. And uh, one of my personal friends now is a guy named Walter Bond. Um, he's a Hall of Fame. He's a Hall of Fame speaker. He's he's he speaks a hundred times a year. He's he's just an awesome guy. Uh, but uniquely, he was also in the NBA, and he played for the Utah Jazz uh, during the Carl Malone uh, John uh, Carl Malone days. And um, he talks. One of the things he talks about is, you know, how did he, how do, how do you play professional basketball? How do you make it in the NBA? Um, and how do you make it when you're not Michael Jordan, right? How do you, how do you make it as a guy in the NBA, not the superstar? And he, he said it boiled down to habits and rituals. So inside the execution of your disciplines, uh, what are the habits and rituals? What are the things that must be done, the, the non-starters? Um, is the internal message of the process and the goal that you're trying to get in alignment with what is going out to the customer. Let me illustrate that for a second. We want more deals. We want more deals, but uh, nobody wants to be aggressive to get those deals. From the 1st through the 15th, we want to hold all the gross, but we send the message out to the customer about how we take every deal and how aggressive we are, and then the 15th to the through the, through the 28th or the 31st, uh, we'll do anything to make the deal. Now our messages are out of alignment. That makes our execution out of alignment. So also looking for trends. Again, that's why we have to look at data. That's why we have to have information. That's why we have to look at things like why we don't make deals or what, what happens with deals we lose. What are the trends? What are the things that we can see coming? Is it Do we have a conversion issue? Do we have an appointment set issue? Do we have a kept appointment issue? Do we have a issue of conversion once the customer gets to the store? Um, where are the trends inside the data, inside the information? So when you talked about change earlier, Eliana, that's how we make change. Not change for the sake of change. We look at information. We review information. We look at what's happening. We look for trends. We look for things that are happening, and then we make our adjustments uh, to make those points. All right. That is the seven disciplines. Make sure to download that handout um, that, that Eliana has been so kind to upload for you uh, because it's kind of a do-it-yourself 
um, strategy for you guys to sit down with your team and, and go through each of those disciplines. There's a couple elements there uh, to hopefully give you some insights to, to check the box and some things that you're already doing well on. Um, I believe there's probably some things maybe you hadn't thought about as much that, that um, maybe now you will take a look at here. At the end of the day, you know, what we know is progress is indeed a process. So I'm encouraging everybody to uh, let's get started. Eliana. Thank you so much, Corey. You are amazing. All right, let's go forward a couple slides. And uh, I do, yes, want to tell people to... Oh, what do we have here, my friend? <laughs> What's that? What's that? Um, on the on the slide. Suggested resources. Yeah, did you go through those? I hadn't talked about it. No. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm talking about it now. I'm talking about it now. I want to give you some suggested resources. Number one, well, I thought you were going to say it, but that's okay. That's why we work so well together. <laughs> uh, I encourage everybody to watch Progressive Retail. You can watch that on our site. Also, if you're not familiar with our, our virtual training, Mosley 24-7, and uh, I encourage you to read the book, um, The Way I See It, Thoughts, Commentary, and Musings of a Retail Car Guy. Action items. You're right. I should have done this. Action items. <laughs> Self-evaluate <laughs> yourself and the dealership. We got, our, we got a good blooper reel. Self-evaluate yourself and the dealership based on the self-discipline, on the seven disciplines. So, yeah, make that download. And... Trace the origin of your current strategy and determine if it is built for the future or the past. Many times I ask somebody, How, why do we do it this way? Why do you work this process? Why do you do it? And they say, that's the way we've always done it. So look, look to close the gaps in your process and execute and implement changes quickly. I want you to have momentum. So a lot of times you may have some aha moments coming off of this call right now. You download that document execute on that document, and then work through whatever internal process. If you see an opportunity for change, don't put it in the drawer and say, I'll come back to it at the beginning of the month because we're in the second half of the month. To get momentum, you got to execute and implement changes quickly to keep the momentum going. Now back to you, Eliana. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Okay. Audience, we're looking for those questions. Get those questions in. We already have a nice bunch of them in the queue, but we want to know if you have a question we can help you with relating to the seven disciplines of internet sales success, or really any question you have for Corey Mosley is fine with me. <laughs> Send those questions in. We're going to get to them in <laughs> just another minute. Now, before we do that, I do want to, of course, direct your attention over to the handout section of the GoToWebinar interface. In that handout section, you're going to find two wonderful handouts for you. They're available now until the end of this broadcast. The handouts are, of course, number one, today's slide deck. You like what you saw? You want to maybe take those notes home with you? Yeah, you can have them. All you have to do is go to the GoToWebinar interface, look for the word that says handouts, click on the little triangle next to it, it'll open up, and there you're going to find that handout in there. Like I said, download it now, perfect timing. The other handout is uh, the handout that Corey wrote all, you know, it's separate from, they have the same name, of course, but it's separate from the slide deck, and it is a worksheet of sorts on those seven disciplines. So you're going to want both of them. Make sure you download them now. You have, of course, a few more minutes until the end of this broadcast to get those into your computer. All right. Are you ready? Oh, let's turn on our webcams. Where's my webcam? Are you ready, Corey? We're going to give away some prizes now. I wish I had some game show music. I'm hoping one day they're going to give me some you game show music. Step up with that. <laughs> you got to step up with that there. I know. I know. I don't know exactly know who to ask. You think Greg or, or Sean would be the ones to give that to me? <laughs> I'm sure they both have it on their computer. <laughs> they probably do. All right. It's that time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, I announced that our good friends over at Mosley Automotive, they're giving away some great prizes on today's webinar. Two of you lucky webinar attendees are going to win a fabulous prize. And you know what? It's your choice. All you have to do is answer, be the first one to answer our giveaway question correctly. Now, what are we giving away? Well, let's show them, Corey. First, you have an option of winning a signed copy of Corey Mosley's book, The Way I See It. Oh, very fetching picture there as well. Okay. I'm thinner now. <laughs> I'm going to have second edition. I'm going to have them slim this down a little bit. <laughs> No problem. For sure. Now, the other option you have is a coffee mug that says it's okay to rewrite the rules. Oh, very, very pretty. This is very high end. Yeah, this is not like the drinky dink. This is 
This is beautiful. This is a beautiful coffee mug. And your third option, I don't believe he has it in front of him. Maybe he does. I don't know. Is a no. gift box of pecan jacks. They're his really specialty. Stock that in the, I, don't, I don't stock that in the office. No, you but, do. Uh, <laughs> I know. I know. But it is a delicious, delightful uh, thing that you can have. And you can also even give it away to somebody else who loves pecan. Everybody know. Everybody in here, where any, I know you've had Jerry and all these guys on there. So everybody knows the famous pecan jacks now. So... <laughs> Okay, so anyway, you have your choice. First thing you have to do, though, is you have to be the first one to answer the giveaway question correctly. I love when people try to guess the answer to the first question. There, I already have people writing in, so we'll see if any of them were the right answer, but well, I don't know. Those are the guys on the family feud that hit the buzzer before Steve Harvey finishes with the, with, with the thing. <laughs> that is so right. It's never the right answer. Okay, vendors, we're going to ask you to kindly sit this one out. This prize isn't yeah. for dealership personnel only, but we love having you on the show, and we hope you learned there's a no, lot there's today. No vendors, there's no vendors that come on to get my content. Do they? Of course they do. <laughs> Everyone wants to hear from you, Corey. All right, everyone, here we go. Good luck. I hope you were taking some great notes. Good luck, everyone. What are the four key points that comprise the training discipline? What are the four key points that comprise the training discipline? Ooh, let's see. No, no, no. Ooh, wait, oh. Is that right? I, I, you it me. is. Oh, it is. Yeah. Tim Dill, you are the winner today. You have won yourself. Well, I don't know what you've won yet. You're going to have to think. Tim Dill is, I think Tim Dill has won before. <laughs> I know this guy, Tim Dill. You can't help it if he loves you, man. <laughs> I think Tim Dill has won some stuff before. Tim Dill well, congratulations. is here. Let me tell you, the four key points that we were looking for were frequency, freshness, qualification, and diversification. So, and actually, Tim did write in. He said, I have won Corey's book before. <laughs> well, lucky for you, Tim, you get, uh, oh, what did I do here? You get to pick uh, one of the well, other prizes, office, if you'd like. Let me see. Office will contact him. Uh, okay. Oh, you don't want to know what he wanted to win? I wanted to know. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> he says he wants the mug. All right. Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay. The mug it is. The mug it is. All right. I'm so, sending a mug and a bonus sanitizer. I have my own hand sanitizer. I don't have one. It's in the other office, but uh, I'm going to send him out a nice hand sanitizer, too. It smells really good. All right. Tim, if you wouldn't mind, send me your dealership name, and of course, I need your mailing address so we can get that prize out to you as quickly as possible. All right. Don't worry, audience. You know what? you got another chance to win, so get your game face on, everyone. Here we go. Second question coming its way now. Name three of the five key points to building a winning team. Hope you guys took great notes. We're looking for three of the five key points to building a winning team. Let's see. Oh, oh, here we go. First person to write in the correct response is Chris Lawrence. And that name does not sound familiar to me, so I'm curious, Chris Lawrence, if you were a first-time dealer on Webinar Prize winner, he says, know them grow them, and inspire them. Chris Lawrence, you are the winner. We would have also accepted involve them and reward them. Congratulations, Congratulations Chris Lawrence. Chris. Yes, um, he says he's a first-time winner and a many-time attendee. Congratulations. Let me write down your name. Let's make this official. Chris Lawrence, would love to know what dealership you're from, sir. I also am going to need your mailing address. And I'm very curious, are you going to pick the book, the mug, or the box of Pecan Jacks? Chris hasn't written in yet. But now listen, while Chris and Tim are getting me that information, I want to talk to the rest of you. I know we gave away two really cool prizes today, and you might not have been the winner if your name wasn't Tim Dill or Chris Lawrence. But you know what? We give away cool prizes every week. So come on back to another Dealer on Webinar, and that might be the lucky day that you win a cool prize on a Dealer on Webinar. Right now we're going to congratulate Tim Dill, who still hasn't told me. Oh, he's with Bow Ford in North, no, in Clanton, Alabama. All right. And Chris Lawrence. Where, where, who's with Clanton? Who's in Clanton, Alabama? That is Tim Dill. Oh, okay. Okay, and then Chris. Where, so Tim, where, where is that? Where is that near? Is that near Huntsville? Tim, is it near Huntsville? <laughs> yeah, is that near Huntsville, Tim? He hasn't written back in yet. He's probably still high fiving all the people at his dealership. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> um, he says it's between Montgomery and Birmingham. Okay. All right. All right. I All like right. Alabama. I've been there several times. I like Alabama, too. All right. Chris Lawrence is with Airport Marina Honda in L.A., California, and he wants oh. the book, and he would All like right. you to sign it for him. <laughs> I will. I will do just that. I was just in. I was just in L.A. at a. He's with Honda. I was just at a Honda store in L. in uh, in the L.A. market. So I was just in your neck of the woods. All right, Chris and Tim, you're going to be getting your prize directly from our good friends over at Mosley Automotive. And by the way, Chris says, "Stop by next time." What are you waiting for? And <laughs> I, I don't think the other Honda store would like me stopping by his deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible, but you never know. All right. So congratulations, Tim and Chris. Thank you, everyone, for playing along. Stop by at another dealer on webinar. We always give away cool prizes. And, of course, we've got to thank our good friends over at Mosley Automotive for their incredible generosity. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, beautiful. And uh, let's get to those questions, all right? Okay. All right. Here we go. I'm going to scroll up, and let's see. First question comes in from Chad. Uh, not really a question but more of an observation on his part. Chad no. says, oh, and by the way, you can go to the next slide so people have all your contact information. Chad says, being in a market where it's difficult to find salespersons, there is a fear of pushback from the salespeople to attempt to change directions as many are pretty complacent rather than working harder and following processes to make more money. The salespeople that he's been near expect spiffs to earn more with no extra effort. Have you found that to be true, Chris? And if so, how would you expect somebody who's in the environment that Chad is in to, uh, you know, get people to work, you know, with more oomph, let's say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, ultimately, the, the, the thing I immediately would say, again, not knowing all the details, but the thing I immediately have to say is I have to look at my recruiting practices. So when we say, I'll give you a great example. So we have a we have Publix supermarkets uh, that have just come into our market. So Publix for, for people in Florida and the areas that they are, they're very well known. Their customer service is outrageous. They still walk your groceries to your car and the little woman put them on the conveyor belt for me last week. So I didn't even load my own groceries onto the conveyor belt to get rung up. Somebody does that. They're well known for that. <clears throat> Many people argue in our particular market that the talent pool is pretty tough um, in terms of some challenges with, I don't know, intelligence or, or just different things, that it's a challenging market. So if they come in and they've opened five, six, seven different stores in our marketplace, it's amazing that, lo and behold, when you go into the store, their culture has not changed, even though supposedly it's supposed to be harder to find great people like the other markets where they're from. I can still go into, I'm going into their stores now and getting the same experience that they're known for delivering in Florida. So there's something in the cultivation, there's something in how they recruit, there's something in how they coach and develop people. So when we say it's tough to find salespeople in the market, maybe we need to redefine who, the, who we're trying to recruit, what their qualifications are, and what we're going to invest in them into showing them a process or a way to do business. Um, unless you're telling me you're in some remote part of, at least you're telling me you're, you're in some place with, you know, population of, of 1,000 um, and the nearest people are hours and hours away, I would start to look at what our training process is, what our recruiting process is, and what makes the salesperson or a good salesperson that we want to hire. I came into the business with the sell me this pen guy. That was the that, that was the barometer that I had to get over. Some I've seen organizations that hire based on the fact that you can pass the drug test and you're not a criminal. So you have to look at what the standards are when we start talking about long-term replacing people because what I cannot see being allowable, and I have seen this also, I have seen people destroy the dealership and run the dealership into having to be sold or gone. I can think in my head right now of a dealership I can drive right by. It's a CVS now because the dealer let its people ruin the whole deal because the dealer said, I can't get my people to do this or I can't find great people or all of these other factors and was not willing to make the tough decisions. And now um, it's a CVS. 
And no, he didn't sell the property cash out and make money off the CVS deal. The franchise was taken and he didn't own the land. So it didn't go well. So at some point, everybody in a decision-making position is going to have to make the decision on what what the future will look like and start to make the changes internally right. to get better people. Okay. Well, I have to say, Chad, great point, great question. Corey, phenomenal answer. Thank you so much. If you have a follow-up, we'd love to hear back from you, Chad. Thank you. All right. I want, to know, I want you to know, Corey, you opened up a can of worms when you talked about who else-itis? So we have <laughs> many, many people who commented on it. So I'm going to read a few of them, and then we're going to end up okay. with a question, okay? Okay. So first question, uh, sorry, first comment came in from Dan, and he says, oh, great point, Corey. I found a company in New York City, for instance, that does a 360 virtual reality vehicle retailing photos for Facebook. It is awesome, but I cannot convince our team to get past the who else-itis. Right. George wrote in, my dealership definitely suffers from who else-itis. I work every day to push my senior management to take small risks and in new marketing areas, and I love that you mentioned this. And then finally, George. He wrote in, my question for Corey as a digital marketing manager is what is the best way to cure who else-itis? When I pitch new ideas like paying money for help on Instagram or new softwares to try, all I ever get back is, who else has done this? What are the numbers behind this? When generally, those are difficult to track down anyway. So Corey, how do we cure who else-itis? Dr. Corey Mosley, what can you do to help us? <laughs> Well, let me make a couple comments. First off, I mean, advocacy is so, so important. So just know for, for the people who are not empowered to make decisions that I am advocating that every opportunity I get. So several of the things that I'm fortunate enough to do, a lot of keynote speaking and things of that nature for the dealer associations um, across the country where the person in the room is the dealer, where I am addressing this, where I'm trying to, to wake them up and bring them and pull them forward in that way also. So certainly advocacy, peer-to-peer -peer advocacy is going to be, uh, it's going to be important. There, you know, sometimes that question is like trying to answer the question that I get, well, Corey, how do I sell that one customer who doesn't want to give me their phone number, doesn't want to give me the, the when I can communicate with them, doesn't want to answer any of my questions? Sometimes the answer is you don't. Sometimes you don't change that person. Um, however, I will tell you, and I think of Gary Vaynerchuk saying one time when he was asked about ROI, and he said, what's the ROI of your mother? How do you put an ROI on all that she's done for you uh, to raise you? How do you ROI that? But... <clears throat> There's a couple practical ways. So, of course, answering the question of how this will improve sales or whatever that's trying to improve, sales, conversions, uh, leads, right. uh, having that question answered already um, can help. So versus going in and saying, hey, I came by this great new, great new thing and it's going to help us do this and help us do that, and then can we try it? And then the pushback becomes who else has done it and those questions versus I've seen this great new technology. Here's, here's, the, here's the science of the study behind it or, hey, we know 30% of people are moving the, to Instagram or starting to utilize that. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Here's how I think this will help us sell cars. You have to answer that question first um, or help us protect gross profit or help us not have to give cars away through other third parties that will rename name nameless that charges every time we sell a car or whatever. Um, here's a way that we can control our traffic better, and here's the reason why we can affect cost per sale. We feel like we we're missing five or ten deals. You have to close the gap on that, or else it just seems like all you want to do is spend money. So when people ask me, you know, hey, how did you how did you get to the consulting side from the retail side? I boil it down to the sound bite. I was fortunate enough to work for some dealers that allowed me to spend their money to find some things that worked and some things that didn't. But if you're always seen as, oh, what is it that you come in to want me to buy now to, to sell more cars online to these Internet customers? Because my empathy for the dealer is what they don't understand or what they're coming to terms with is you have to do all of these things just to be where you are now. 
it's not always the equation of if I do this. Sometimes it's about protecting market share. It's not just, well, if I spend another $5,000, I should sell 10 more cars. No, there's things that you're going to have to invest in just to be where we are right now so we don't go backwards. So I think closing the gap on that and having and answering the question that they will inevitably ask, how will this contribute to car sales? You have to answer that question effectively. And then the second thing is, I, I think, don't be afraid to make that case. I, no, I can't tell you 100 dealers are on it. I think we found something that will help us get a competitive edge. I'm in the meetings with owners all the time. They, most of them want to kill and slaughter the competition. Many of them don't talk. They don't like each other. It, their, their competitive spirit, I talked about inspiration, they're inspired by the idea that they can go to that dealer meeting next month and give the smackdown to their competition. So you also want to find out what, the, what makes the decision makers tick. Is it gross profit? Is it selling more cars? What makes them tick that will help you get, that you can tap into that will help get their agenda across? I have a client, I know that he wants to crush the guy down the street. So if I introduce something, because it's not like because it's coming from me, I fight for budget, I fight for expense, and, and fight them to try things just like you do at your, at, at your store. If I'm having that conversation, I will point out, hey, I think I've got a way that we can get a competitive edge on X, Y, Z. Oh, so appeal I to their this, vanity? <laughs> I think this is, absolutely. I think, I, I, I'm, I'm on a charity board, and I tell them all the time, I'm writing you this check because it makes me feel good. It's going to help people, but I'm very honest with myself. I'm doing it because I feel good being able to do it. So, um, you know, so you have to be honest with yourself, but I will say in a minute, hey, this is where we're weak. I think we can I think this I think we can get a leg up on XYZ down the street if we implement this. I'm going to get his attention. And then we'll get to where it costs and how we're going to sell cars. I'm going to have the answer to that too because I'm going to show how it addresses a gap in our process or our execution or our procedure that will allow us to, to sell more cars or protect gross profit or increase CSI, whatever mm -hmm. the outcome is. Got to deal in outcomes. That's going to be very, very important. But some people will never you get know, over who else I just will never conform. And they'll be selling. They'll be selling soon. You'll get a letter that says, hey, we just made a deal to sell our store or something will happen. I mean, people don't think of it that way, but that will happen. The the manufacturers are cracking down. I work with five manufacturers. The letters are going out, pulling the franchise. You're not sales effective. You're not this. So that's gonna that's gonna happen as well as the as the business continues to contract. Hope I helped with that answer. Yes, George and Dan, thank you so much for for putting us out there on the who else itis. I hope that helped you out. Well, we're, I really we're do. running long and we're holding most of the audience. I, that's that's, I that's pretty good. I know, yeah. I know. Well, we do have a few more questions and they certainly deserve to be answered. So let's keep going. Okay, okay. Uh, we we uh, have to make Ron feel better. All right, because this question is breaking my heart. Um, okay. Ron says, in your opinion. Why do you think that the BDC or the Internet Department is considered the red-headed stepchild of the dealership? Because I feel that the Internet Department and the BDC is the heart of the dealership and the, in the blood of the dealership, also known as money flows through the BDC. Right. So, you know, I don't think I have a 100% answer for that. I, I dealt with that. I worked for a manager, and, and listen, we didn't have as sophisticated reporting and CRM data back then. But I, I dealt with managers. I, I would, and people still do this to this day. Anybody in here in manage, anybody on this call on this webinar in management, um, you do some type of offline report. You might use a CRM, but you've got some kind of Excel or some kind of. And I would spend all the time doing my percentages because I didn't have the ROI report from Dealer Socket like you have now, right? Uh, so I would do my report, my Excel spreadsheet, closing ratios and sources, and I'd be so proud. I'd print it out. I'd go take it upstairs to my manager, and I'd watch him take it, look at it, open his drawer, lift up all the other papers in his drawer, and shove it in there. Uh. <laughs> I watched myself turn in $1.3 million in gross profit and make it sound like, uh, where's the rest of it? <laughs> so I know. I don't have a 100% answer. I believe it's a couple things. Number one, most of your decision makers and owners didn't come up to that business. So they don't understand completely the importance of it because they didn't work in that model. So most most general managers, most dealership owners weren't BDC reps 
or BDC managers or internet directors or digital marketing managers. Um, so I think the appreciation factor is, is slightly different. Number two, they're so expense driven. So remember, they look at the department and they go, here's payroll, here's, uh, here's our marketing expense. Man, my, now we're spending $125,000 on digital marketing now. Oh my goodness, and I got eight people, and now you're telling me I need more to handle more leads. So it's check writing, check writing, check writing. So interesting thing, and this isn't a plug, we, we actually don't even talk about it publicly, we only use it for our clients, mm -hmm. but we just finished building our own metrics dashboard. So we're actually producing profit and loss statements for internet departments and BDCs now. So owners can actually see, here's my wage cost, here's my marketing cost, here's my gross profit, here's my true cost per sale, and here's actually my, pro my BDC and internet department is a profit center and not the expense that we love to try to make right. it out to be. Right. I think that's it. That's that's part of the tale. Again, it's another thing we're trying to do to advocate in that area to change the culture and change the change the thinking. But I think not having been in the seat and the financial aspects of it, where you produce those leads, you're in a department selling 100 cars. Well, those 100 cars are lumped in with the other 300 that the dealership sells, or the other 200. So on a financial statement, thinking about how a dealer or a general manager thinks, on a financial statement, that is gross. That is a front end, uh, front end gross, back end gross profit line. It's not broken out. It is one line. So the dealership made money, lost money, average per copy. That's all in one bucket. So what they see is checks going out for digital marketing, checks going out the personnel. They don't see the gross profit directly correlating to the department. And I think that drives a lot of the mentality where they're hesitant to invest or the overall opinion of it. And again, if you're not going for top quality talent, that also drives the opinion as well. Okay, so Ron, I thought every point that, oh, he already wrote in. All right, uh, Ron says, my GM and myself are on the same page, but past dealerships I've worked for never thinks the same. Very interesting, right. and by the way, Ron, um, your redheaded stepchild analogy, yeah. Brandy wrote in and said, oh, how rude. LOL. And then George wrote in, I couldn't agree more. The fact, yeah. He says, I couldn't agree more. The fact that our BDC manager doesn't get invited to our Google PPC marketing meetings to report the effectiveness of our internet, social, and website changes still baffles me. So, <laughs> and Ron wrote back in, no offense, Brandy. And <laughs> David wrote in, I have an awesome redheaded grandson, so I take offense. <laughs> so... <laughs> Go with red herring. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, they are treated a bit differently. But, Corey, I think your insight as to why and that they're seen as an expense and not as the profit center that they are right. and just not treated the same, I think that's good. But I love what you're doing to counteract that, and I think that's a perfect solution. So I wish you the best of luck with that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ron, you got a follow-up question? We're here for you, my friend. Okay, let's get to this one. Okay. Um, Dan wrote in. He says, Corey, I type 100 to 120 words per minute, but our team members don't. We have a lot of peck and hunt typers. Have you come across this at any of the dealerships you work with? And are there any effective strategies for encouraging sales team members to develop their typing skills? It's a major limiting factor in responding to online leads in a timely manner. And just in general, almost everything we do now requires typing. What do you think? Um, you know, I've never really, I've never really given a lot of thought to that. I will say something controversial, but certainly don't have the time to debate it, so we'll have to table it for another day. Okay. But I, I favor as much automation, um, as much pre-content as I possibly can, uh, because I think it it, it creates uh, scale um, and it allows for volume. So I'm not sure, so other than sending people to Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing, which I think is still available online somewhere to help people get better, I'm not only concerned with, uh, if someone types fast but still doesn't know how to use English properly, that's just as bad. <laughs> so, All right, you got a point so, there. <laughs> so, you know, as people start uh, sending out emails and, you know, again, outside of customizing an email or answering a person's question, um, I like a lot of stuff that I can vet already. Mm -hmm. So the so the template library, even text messages that have standard 
standard things we're asking. I mean, that's how AI works, right? And that's how bots are working now, right? They have predictive answers already. Uh, you know, when you open a chat window for Verizon, it starts out with a series of questions that it asks you that you're really not even talking to an agent until you get past certain things. So, right. um, but it's more about their use of the English, English language as well um, than typing. And then also, I'm really an email phone showroom person, right. so I don't know completely how much time I'm spending am I trying to sell the car too much there's so many different variants there in that end but but to, to, to the overreaching answer there um, it certainly would not it's certainly no different than sending somebody to get training on coaching no different than the usage of the English language and mm -hmm. executing that property because people have the tendency to type how they talk and that could come off so wrong on, I actually do that <laughs> but I can get away with it I'm not trying to sell anyone anything <laughs> so dangerous with like dealers who do their own chat in-house versus a company who does nothing but folk, who has pre they have a methodology under how they approach it um, you, you get on there you know hey how can I help you and it gets all loosey-goosey and you do that with the wrong customer you're really running people off uh, but I certainly am not against the idea of better educating people or or helping people type better or 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 Creating, or training them to do that, or right. or or that kind of things. So I wouldn't advocate against well, that. I don't. Um, see, I don't see how people can respond to fifty leads, or even I've heard one hundred and twenty leads a day if they're not very good typers and can't put it into the CRM. So. Right. Well, I mean, again, that goes back to logistics. So leads mm -hmm. should be going into CRM. Your initial process should have. I mean, there should be templates. Uh, again, people think of templates as canned things. But you know things get canned because they work, right? You take a process that works over and over again, and that's how it becomes a process. That's how a system becomes a system. That's how something becomes systemized. That's why you go into Chipotle and they run you through the line. The scoop is pre-measured so the guy doesn't get too much chicken, so they don't waste food. The 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 rice tastes the same in every location. There's a reason for systems and repetitiveness and those type of things. So there's something to be said for um, for that. I am just. Astounded. I feel like I could give you a challenge to make a uh, metaphor using almost anything. You've already brought up, uh, you know, a 30-year-old movie, and now you've brought up the fast food chain. So <laughs> I am just astounded people, people, that you can do that's that. A, that's the way, way that people. That's the way that people get things. They they can. You make it relational, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so Dan, just so you know, thank this you. This is so like a marathon. Day. I mean, I you know. normally are like well, it's a very interesting the... topic, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for pulling this out. How many more questions do we have? Uh, uh, three or four more. Okay, okay. Dan. <laughs> Dan says. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, by the way, Dan, I just wanted you to know, other people wrote in. He says, George wrote in, um, Mario teaches typing. You can gamify it. Uh, David Sharp wrote in, amen. And by the way, Dan did write back in and said, by the way, if any of your salespeople are having trouble speaking English when they type, uh, use Grammarly.com. It's a great free Chrome plugin that that helps you with your English while you're the paid version but yeah it does uh, and we do that in our analysis when we go in and analyze in their departments we run their templates through Grammarly and and report back to them so that is a that is a definitely good resource ah uh, thank you so much alright thank you for bringing that up Dan great question okay let's go to this next one now Chad wrote in and Chad says internet leads using an artificial intelligence platform to respond and work leads until a phone number is captured before turning them over to salespeople. Corey, have you heard of this and what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, there's several companies that do it. Um, I'm not naming companies. Um, you know, I, I think I, I, I am always leery to give prescriptive measures on a broad scale. So like you look at the seven disciplines, those are uni those are universal things that find success. Mm -hmm. You'll find different success within how you are able to implement each of those things, but um, I, let's just say I have go I have worked with stores that have that and they no longer have it. So Okay, so, so they try so it. I, 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 yeah, I think and again, that doesn't mean they don't have people where it doesn't work and I'm not attacking any particular company and because mm -hmm. they all have singers and dealers who love them and love their process. I think you have to look at, I mean, so many decisions, staffing, uh, you know, what type of CRM. I know people that are on substandard CRMs 
and they have to use these type of processes. I know stores that um, are under are severely understaffed, so they need to bring in different services like that that help lead cultivate because they don't have the staff to get to it. So I think there's so many different reasons why you may need to use that type of service. Mm -hmm. People who use outsourced BDCs, who have people work dealerships that pay companies to work their leads off site. I'm not indicting those things. I've used companies like that in the past because we were in the middle of recruiting and there was one person in the store right. that, trying to handle 500 leads. So there's a, there's a, there could be a place for using those type of things. I don't know that if I looked at high, if I, if I mapped out my list of a high performing dealership and everything that they did, I can't say that I would go, they use an AI chatbot mm -hmm. thing that cultivates until I don't know that that would be on my list. So I'm not knocking it because there are people that make it work. I think it's a very personal decision to your dealership, staff. There's a lot of logistics that go into whether or not that can be successful or not. But there are people, there are companies making a lot of money selling that service, and, and there are dealers who are happy um, with it or utilizing it for different reasons. I, I, I love everything that you're saying, and I also don't know enough about that uh, technology, but I would have a worry that it might seem a bit impersonal to the shopper, but then again, I don't know. I, I would love to people, check out. I mean, people, people, I mean yeah, again, there's so it's gotten so now, I mean, people don't know, I mean, really, in a lot of instances. You know, I, what, the problems I see with it, there's a lot of, there's redundancies. Um, is your CRM firing off stuff too, and this other system's working? So we see challenges with redundancy there. Um, Sometimes, I, for me personally, you know, my organization, we just don't like the messaging that they're using. So it's not consistent. So I talked about, right, internal, external consistency. Right, right. The, some of the messages that the third-party companies are sending out to get engagement aren't messages that, you know, fit the dealership's process. Hey, would you like, uh, you know, kind of, we, we've got a special offer for $500 discount today. There are some stores that are like, no way, we don't want to do that kind of thing. So, <laughs> okay. so I think those are a little, those are some of the areas where, um, you know, technology can help. Listen, there's technology, right? We all have iPads, but but what have I been doing over here? I'm taking notes. Um, I'm not typing. <laughs> I, I use paper as notes, well. Right? So, <laughs> we've got books all, you know, we've got journals and books all over the place, all over the office. So. Um, Okay. Right. Well, just so you know, uh, Chad wrote in, thank you once again. Ron, just so you know, Chad, he wrote in, we have a select few that answers calls nights and weekends, and they have great success answering a call after hours, and the closing ratio is really high, and it sets the next day up really well. Well, Ron, I wish you continued success with that. Thank you so much. By the way, Chad also said, thank you, Chris and Eliana. I really enjoyed the presentation, and I look forward to sharing it to our auto group. I like the sound of that. All right, mm -hmm. Chad. All right, next uh, question. Um, actually, one last question, I believe. Okay. Comes in from Tim. He says, I recently heard of a dealership using a team approach. Two salespeople working deals together. I'm wondering if you've heard of this. It sounds kind of interesting since different people have different strengths. What do you think? This comes um, in from I mean, Tim. I'm, not, I'm not quite clear on the logistics of what that means, meaning – they work deals together, meaning they pool their they pool their deals, and whoever. Sell, uh, I, I'm not sure. I need more detail on that. I'm not okay. really sure how to. Answer, I'm not really sure how to answer that question, as it relates to working deals together, where right. they both get credit. So whoever whoever works the lead, it doesn't matter who gets credit for the sale. The department wins. If he's saying that, then I've seen that. I work. I actually worked in that type of environment 15 years ago. Um, where it wasn't about who you know who sold what, we would take each other's calls, we would make each other's calls, do each other's follow up, because mm -hmm. it was all from the common point, and then we pooled all of the money, uh, you know, the commission pool as as our pay plan was set up, that went into a pool, and we took a split across from that. That's so, very interesting. Um, so we had no interest in you know who was off or that's my lead, who who's whose customer is this and who split deal or whatever. Um, that eliminate it worked really really well for us. It eliminated. Um, a lot of that stuff and allow us just to focus on the customer. Right, and now um, there's so, those there's um there's those dealerships now that are out there and they have no commission and they just they just get paid very well and they have to sell as many cars as they can. Yeah. <laughs> there's that too. Everyone's a little yeah. different. 
right? I mean, everybody wants to be Apple, but, you know, Apple's margins, the margin on an iPhone is far mm -hmm. greater than the margin on the new Elantra um, that's coming out at the, at the Hyundai store. So, okay, well, Tim did uh, write back, and he says he believes with that kind of setup that they split all the deals. Yeah. So I, I think as long as the math pencils, it, it does remove a big issue. You know, what BDC or Internet Department doesn't have the issue of it's my, whose deal is it, whose customer, that's my customer, mm -hmm. or, you know, who's off. I've heard people tell it, I've heard people say so-and-so's off. Uh, would you like to leave her a message? Like a, a call back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so not go to make the appointment, not try to, not try to. <laughs> not stop, help you know. out that person at all. <laughs> correct, correct. Oh, she's off. Would you like her voicemail? You kidding? <laughs> so, I, so, so I think that I said, as long as the math, as long as it pencils right, as we say, mm -hmm. um, I think that can be. I think that can be highly effective. Okay, one final question that snuck in. Tim, thank you so much for that point, by the way. If that's something you're willing to try, I'm, I'm curious to see how it would work out, by the way. Okay, the last question came in from Ron. He says, hey, our team doesn't send emails or templates. We don't use templates. My team does video emails. Your thoughts on video email, Corey? Oh, I think video is great. I think you have to have the logistics to execute it. Mm -hmm. um, I have no issues with video emails and the bomb bomb wars and who, whatever you co video whoever you like to use or who's the greatest video trainer in the game right now. I think all of that stuff is great and fine. I have no, I have absolutely no problem with that. Video is very powerful. Nobody would refute that. Um, execution is going to be key and mm -hmm. the logistics of it. So I, what I love for everybody to be sitting videos, yeah. But what I would not do is say video is the way you must go and take a store that's got broken processes, broken CRM, they can't convert the people when they come in and go, great news everybody, we're gonna just start doing videos to everybody. So Ron's very unique, in fact, Ron's gonna be on my show, um, Progressive Retail, so Ron's very unique, he's doing a lot of things right and they have processes and engagement and involvement and buy-in to allow him to execute that strategy. So um, it's great, but it's, if you don't have some of these other things covered, if we're still answering the phone sales, um, you know, there's some other there's some other logistics um, before we start wanting to become video ninjas. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think videos of certainly a, a very good strategy, and I have no issues with it. Um, it's just where does it fit into your into your mix? Got it, got it, Ron. Thank you so much, and good luck on the show. I hear the host is pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> now, before I let you go, Corey, I did want yep. to tell you, uh, David sent in a very nice comment. He said, Corey, you did a fantastic job on not just presenting static information, but spurring on the implementation of change. Very well done, sir. I couldn't agree more. Now, Corey, I want you to tell everyone how, uh, I should tell you this too, I didn't say it, but a lot of people wrote in and said that they love your show on CBT. And also oh. others, others wrote in, wanted to know how they can tune into that channel. And also, why don't you tell everyone where they can get a copy of your book? Well, I'll give you the uh, I'll give you the the not, the answer CBT doesn't want me to give you. Oh. The answer to watch the show is to go to mostlyautomotive.com. <laughs> way to make friends, Corey. <laughs> They'll tell you to go to CBT, but the way to watch we have all uh, I think we're up to 41 episodes. We have all the shows um, on mostlyautomotive.com, mm -hmm. and I didn't make a big hubbub, but last week we did go live with a new site, so uh, so we're very proud of the new oh. uh, look and feel of our site too. But. Um, the book is on the first page of the site, uh, great for conversions. Mostlyautomotive.com, right? Yeah, Mostlyautomotive.com, the book's okay. on the first page. Um, it's 14 bucks. I'll sign it, send it right from our office. I'd um, love to get your feedback on it. It's gone over very well in the industry. I think we've got about um, 3,000 copies in circulation. So it's not a John Grisham novel, but I think it's a, a great read for you. Um, and then the shows, all the archives of the shows are online, uh, are on Mostly Automotive as well. So I think, you know, I thank everybody for their kind words and their feedback. And, you know, we want to do what we can for the industry. Um, we've got something really, really important coming um, that I can't, uh, it, this really, really, oh, it wasn't, I, I, could, I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you a slide on it because um, I'm working on it with my team. Um, but anybody who's on this webinar is on the list. You'll, you'll know, I will send out the information to you. Um, but it's, something very, very important and something we're going to be doing going into 2018 with a select group of people uh, that we're going to pour a lot into. Um, so everybody that's on this webinar will know about it. Um, Am I going to know about it? I mean, where's your carrot, Corey? Jesus. 
<laughs> yeah, well, you, you'll know about it. You're a, you're a pipeline to all these wonderful people. So I, I have to tell you. You're not going to say it. You're really not going to say it. Come on, give us a little hint. It, it's, it, I, I said it. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, something that we're going to be doing for 2018 with a small group of dealers mm -hmm. um, exclusively um, mm -hmm. that we're, we're um, no longer going to be taking on um, a broad range of clientele. Um, so it's going to be a very, very closed group that we're going to be working with. Um, and, and we're working on the details. So it's and the news be comes out when? Um, we're, we're, hoping to, we're hoping to be ready um, first week of October. Okay, so I got to wait yep. a few more weeks. All yeah. right, yeah. all right. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing the news. I always yeah. love to see how you are moving and shaking in this industry. Thank you so much, Corey. <laughs> Thank always you. Always a pleasure. Hopefully, I will get you on another. Wow, I can't believe two hours we've been on this thing. Thank you to everybody. <laughs> hey, that's we're five already. hours early, Corey. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I, here's what I will say. A guy named Jim Rohn taught me this a long time ago. He always would end with, um, when he thanked people, he would say, Listen, the one thing that we can, we can always make more money, we can always do other things. The one thing we can't get back is time. So I'm very appreciative. I hope I provided value. I'm very appreciative of you, of everybody in this audience giving me their time today, and I hope it was of value to them. I couldn't agree more with that. I'm always appreciative when people come on our shows every week. So thank you, audience. We couldn't do this without you. And yes, we hope we gave you some value today. Corey? I know you gave me value today, so thank you so much, sir. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm looking forward to having another couple shows with you in 2018, I hope. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, you know, I always still take your calls. <laughs> Phew. Thank God. <laughs> All right. So I want to remind the audience that a link to download a copy of today's webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars to view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. And hey, yeah. This webinar is going to conclude in another moment, and when it does, you are going to get a short survey. It is legitimately three questions. It's so easy. So please take the time to fill out that questionnaire. We would really love to know what you thought of today's presentation. It would really help us out. And Dealeron is going to be presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit in Vegas. So if you're going to be there, hey, stop by, say hi, check out the incredible speaking sessions by Greg Gifford and Sean Rains. We hope to see you there. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar. Oh, it's a big one, too. An expert from Facebook is going to share their first ever Facebook's automotive retail playbook. What? Okay, audience, have you ever asked yourself, what the heck can I do on Facebook to grow my business? Or what's the secret to selling cars on Facebook? Well, guess what? Facebook is spilling all of their secrets. Facebook has released their first ever automotive retail playbook at the end of the summer, and now we're bringing you all the goods direct from Facebook. Facebook's Gabrielle Garrison is back, and this time she's bringing the fire. She will break down all of the facets of this playbook, which highlights the critical factors, strategies, and best practices when approaching your Facebook marketing initiatives, from setting up page for the first time, to full funnel best practices, to proper measurement, there is valuable information for all levels of Facebook advertising. Literally everything you need to know is going to be in this playbook. And it is specifically tailored to dealerships. So get your hands on this must-have Facebook automotive retail playbook. If you're ready to step up your advertising game like a boss, have the highest levels of marketing success on Facebook, then don't you dare miss this must-see presentation. So register now. And don't forget, Dealeron's weekly webinars are held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, well, hey, we'd love to hear from you. Please connect with me directly. Again, my name is Eliana Raggio, and I'm everywhere. I'm on all the automotive social networks. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, you name it, everywhere. Or you know what? You can just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in Dealeron's continuing education series. Take care, everyone.